Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this lecture. Um, we are really in the final stretches of the, of the semester, uh, including this lecture. We have uh, three more uh, remaining. So after this, two. Um, and then when we're done, um, so you know, there's light. Uh, we'll just uh, hang in there. All right, so um, we are uh, looking at a, at the recap from uh, two lectures ago. Um, we were we've been uh, distinguishing the different types of learning. Uh, uh, nearly this entire semester, we've been looking at supervised learning, which is uh, you know learning from a quote unquote teacher, uh, meaning that the training data includes the desired output. Uh, we told you that this was, you know, we formulated this problem as a mapping of uh, X to Y, uh, and somehow all of the uh, architecture design came in designing that function. All of the loss functions is what do you optimize and so on. Uh, and your data set contains both X and Y. Um, and so there was a data set of X, Y uh, tuples uh, that, that were given to you, X, Y pairs. Um, in reinforcement learning, it was about learning to act under de delayed uh, evaluative feedbacks or rewards. Um, and so we tried to shimmy in everything about functional approximation and uh, deep networks in either learning a state to action mapping or a, a state action a queue function. Uh, we didn't tell you about models, but um, model based RL, but you know, that's where you could fit in. Um, Unsupervised learning uh, got much more challenging uh, because now the only data set is uh, just data sets of points. Um, there are, there's the goal is to discover structure in the data. The training data set does not include any desired outputs, and that's what makes it challenging. Challenging. Uh, what we what we told you last time, we said you know this is both an opportunity because training data is cheap, um, and this is in some sense the holy grail or a holy grail of uh, machine learning. Um, which is to build automated tools to understand structure in the in the world, visual or otherwise, um, and it's also uh, a big uh, sort of open, uh, both from a practical perspective and from a theoretical perspective, a uh, fairly open problem. Um, there are various sub problems in unsupervised learning because it is so ill posed and poorly specified. Uh, there is the idea of discovering, uh, you know clumps or clusters or uh, data points that go together uh, roughly, um, uh, which is what uh, Kim's clustering does. There's the uh, um, formulation of uh, under discovering a low dimensional structure, so reducing the dimensionality of your data. Um, for example, PCA, uh, there's the uh, way of formulating it as a density estimation problem, which is to build a model uh, P of X uh, that can tell you whether you're looking at a likely data point, an unlikely data point, an outlier, you can do conditional uh, uh, sort of queries. Uh, what would the part of a variable be conditional on another part of a variable? Um, and that's what we are diving into deeper uh, in the last few lectures and in the next few lectures, which is our goal is uh, to do uh, to build generative models, to build models that can take training data, um, which has obviously been sampled, the assumption is it's been sampled from some data uh, generating distribution, and to uh, generate samples from uh, a model that we construct. Um, and this is a fairly sort of procedural or pragmatic definition of density estimation, uh, that we don't actually care about this model directly, we only care about it indirectly through the quality of uh, samples that it generates that we can generate from these models. So the goal, uh, which is sort of precisely uh, specified uh, in sort of a measurable way, is we want to learn a P model similar to P data such that we can generate samples from it. Um, and this is why there's sort of like uh, a, a taxonomy of generative models that we, that we describe that almost immediately we end up with, a, with two families, uh, a family of models um, where you actually get an explicit uh, model and a family of generative models which are implicit density models which can let you sample but do not actually uh, give you that P model. Uh, they may have an implicit model but it's a black box. You cannot query it. Uh, you do not get a likelihood. You do not get your own data and ask for the probability of that of that data. You, you basically have a very hard time comparing methods uh, because these are implicit density methods. Uh, they just give you samples and then you uh, design tests to tell whether the samples are realistic or not. Um, and we said, you know, we're discussing uh, 
three popular uh, models, uh, Pixel, CNNs, RNNs, which we've already done, uh, VAEs, which we're doing today, uh, and GANs, which we'll do in the very last class, uh, not too much. Okay. okay. Uh, all right, so the plan for today is, that was the recap. The plan for today is, uh, uh, is that we're building up towards variational autoencoders. Uh, we will, as a stepping stone, introduce your at least in this class, your first latent variable uh, probabilistic model. Um, and the example that we we'll use is Gaussian mixture models because it's a fairly simple model and it connects to what you've already seen with Kian and uh, Keynes. Um, and uh, we'll also teach you autoencoders and the idea of variational inference today. Uh, we will not be able to get to actual construction of VAEs today, uh, but these are sort of stepping stones, if you will, uh, in that direction. Um, so let's. Uh, let's uh, start. Let's get going in that uh, in that direction. Um, so here's the sort of uh, sort of building blocks of uh, of VAEs. Um, the building blocks are. Uh, let's take a step back and recall that we've been trying to say in all the models that we've been constructing, like pixel RNNs, pixel CNNs. Those are explicit density models. So there is an explicit density p theta of x, uh, which is good. Um, but one of the things that we sort of explicitly wrote down is that we just wrote chain rule, right? Uh, that, you know, X is a random variable. That's the data. Uh, we're going to build a density function or a, or a, pro, or a, or, or a model. And we're just going to, um, model these variables. Our data set recall is just, uh, X I is given to us. I going on through N. Um, N is the number of samples, not the dimensions of, uh, uh of, of X. Um, and, you know, our, our, our attack was fairly direct. If I want a probabilistic model of X, I'm just going to go ahead and construct a probabilistic model of X. Um, latent variable models um, or hidden variable models um, actually take an indirect approach or a, a sort of intermediate approach is they say, I'm going to not just construct um, uh, a model over the observed variables X, but I'm also going to introduce a new variable, um, or these are called latent um, variables or latent random variables. Uh, they're also called unobserved variables or hidden variables. Um, so I'm going to introduce a new variable that my data set doesn't contain. Notice my data set still has only X. There is no Z in my data set. But I'm going to construct a model over this uh, sort of unobserved variable Z. Um, and the intuition uh, that I'm going to appeal to is, well, oops, sorry. After all, uh, P of X given Z is P of X conditioned on Z times P of Z. And this is just, again, chain rule. Uh, this is my uh, conditional. And this is my prior on Z. And I'm going to argue that somehow uh, modeling a conditional with the right latent variable is going to be easier than modeling the joint um, or modeling the marginal P of X. Um, somehow the argument is that this is complex and this conditional is simple or simpler. Um, and you can imagine uh, multiple scenarios in which this would be true. Um, for example, if you're trying to build probabilistic models of images, uh, if Z is, uh, you know, what category is present in the image, what is the pose of the object, uh, let's say, uh, you know, if I, if you have a finite list of categories of objects, if I tell you that there is a, the picture that you have to generate contains a car in the center and a sky at the top and grass at the bottom and maybe there's a tree on the right, then the space or the probabilistic model of images that you have to fit is much narrower. And so maybe that fitting problem is easier. If I condition it on these latent variable Zs, which by the way, the data set doesn't contain annotated. The data set is just a data set of images. I don't know where the car is. I don't know where the tree is. But those are, if, if you had access to these magical latent variables, somehow P of X given Z would be simpler. Um, and of course, you know, a prior is just about, um, how many cars are in the data set, how many trees are in the data set, and so on. Um, but this condition is, is, is simpler uh, than, the, than the marginal. Okay, uh, 
Let me take a look at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's the that's the that's the argument for latent variable models. Um, that's the sort of benefit, and we'll run it through an example to show that this uh, this argument still holds true. Um, but almost immediately, uh, we will run into a problem. In fact, we will run into multiple problems, and we'll show you that. Um, that latent variable models, BAs are an example of latent variable models. Um, they end up defining an intractable density function. Um, what that means is, in if you only have a p of uh, x comma z as your model that you're that you're creating, um, your data set recall only contains x. And so, what we have to do is we have to ask about log marginal likelihood or or uh, the probability of this data data point x that we have observed. And in order to compute it, it requires integrating or marginalizing out. Um, so this is if z is continuous, and it would result in summation p theta of z, p x given z. Ah, apologies. Uh, if z is discrete. Um, this is, by the way, just chain rule uh, on p x comma z, and we are uh, uh, Summing out or integrating out z uh, because we on the left is uh, the marginal. Uh, so uh, this is a latent variable model. Um, it has a problem that uh, our log likelihoods are going to contain these nasty, nasty integrals. Um, look, we're, we're con computer scientists. Um, integrals and closed forms of integrals and in real analysis uh, was a long, long time ago. Um, and uh, we are just not comfortable with integrals. Uh, uh, summations are much better, uh, but they get problematic uh, once you start adding dimensionality. It becomes uh, combinatorial really large, uh, and so these summations are going to be problematic as well. Um, so, okay, that's. That's uh, the idea of a latent variable model. Um, let's run through an example. Um, so here's a really simple example. Um, we will uh, build up uh, and formally define what a Gaussian mixture model is. But an example is, let's say I give you this data set. This is a histogram. Um, and so you know, this is my coarse approx approximation uh, to uh, P of X, where uh, X, let's say, are uh, is some uh, one dimensional object. Um, you know, these are going negative to positive, but let's say these are cores that people achieve in an exam. Um, and let's say there was lots of negative marking, so you end up with like even negative scores. So I'm just making things up here, but you know, let's say that was the case. You know, certainly not uh, the kind of distributions we've been seeing in this class where everything is far to the right and there is just one peak. Um, but it does appear that in whatever exam uh, whose scores we're looking at, um, you stare at this data, this histogram, and you come to the reasonable conclusion that this is definitely not a Gaussian, um, but perhaps this is well modeled by two Gaussians. Um, that there appears to be one segment of the data uh, which has a, uh, a peak uh, or a unimodal fit uh, at one point, um, and there appears to be a second uh, peak of the data that appears to be um, at the second point. So perhaps, uh, you know, there is a there is a subset of people who, who studied and <laughs> did well. There's a subset of people who perhaps were, were surprised by the content. Um, and with, with that sort of a, a, a setup, you can imagine uh, that my argument uh, is coming through, right? Uh, that uh, P of x given z, so this is a case where z can take values one and two. Maybe there are just like z is discrete, it takes values one and two. Uh, maybe the prior for z is just uniform, so it's like 0 0.5, 0 0.5. There are two possible sort of latent variable values. Um, and P of x given z is a sort of Gaussian, um, mu one comma z one. So this is, this is, this is the first Gaussian, and this is the second Gaussian, mu2, comma, uh, sigma2 uh, squared. Um, and maybe in this case, what we're observing is mu1 is minus 10, and mu2 is uh, plus 10. Where recall that uh, this notation, normal mu 
sigma, this is uh, the standard notation for the density function, the PDF of a univariate uh, normal or a Gaussian. Uh, this is the mean parameter. This is the variance parameter. The mean parameter tells you where the Gaussian is centered. In this case, it appears to be centered at 10. In this case, it appears to be centered at minus 10. Uh, we're not precisely specifying the, the variance parameter, but they roughly tell you the, the spread of this, this distribution. Um, and let me take a look at questions. Okay. Um, so that's that's where we are. This is a, a Gaussian mixture model. Quite literally, it is a mixture of Gaussians, meaning that I introduced uh, two Gaussians um, to um, to to fit this uh, this distribution. Um, and I can sort of write this a bit more uh, formally um, in the language of probabilistic modeling. Um, now, for those of you who have seen Bayesian networks before, this will seem familiar. If you have not seen Bayes nets, if you, uh, you know, haven't seen this sort of notation before, don't worry. You know, we're going to use minimal um, sort of parts of that um, because we're just going to be talking about Gaussian mixture models. We're not going to be uh, sort of using the full language of, uh, of Bayes nets. Um, but we are going to be uh, constructing a probability distribution, as I said, of x comma z. There are two random variables. Um, if you have seen Bayes nets before, uh, it corresponds to this sort of a graph. Uh, this is not a neural network. This is a, a Bayesian network, uh, meaning that uh, there is a probabilistic interpretation of the of the random variables. Uh, the arrow indicates the conditionality of the of the model, um, and uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to assume that z, uh, the, random, the latent variable or the unobserved variable, so x is observed. Uh, that is why uh, the standard convention in Bayes nets is to shade it. Um, so this is an observed variable. This is a latent uh, or a hidden variable. Um, we're going to say that z is categorical with parameter pi. Um, and pi is uh, just a, a, a vector, uh, pi 1 through pi k. Um, k, uh, 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 by the way, is the number of possible states. Uh, so uh, instead of two Gaussians, now they can be k Gaussians. Um, and so um, pi c is just telling us the probability uh, that z, the random variable, is equal to c. Right. So that is uh, just us writing that uh, instead of two uh, Gaussians, you can have k Gaussians. Um, and P of x given z equals c uh, is a normal or is a uh, is a Gaussian with mean parameter mu c and variance parameter uh, sigma square c, uh, which means that their uh, their density is given by one over two pi sigma c square e to the negative x minus mu c square by two sigma c squared. Um, and that's just the density of a normal, uh, not, you know, we're not introducing any fundamentally uh, new things here. Um, so this is a conditional, this is a uh, prior, um, pi is our parameter, mu is our parameter, sigma is our parameter. We will learn these parameters just like we do in any uh, sort of model. Um, and we have effectively constructed, uh, because of these two terms, p of x comma z uh, as p of x given z and p of z right as a product of these two we've constructed this this is a gaussian mixture model um, and as with any uh, model um, you can ask uh, questions you can ask for certain types of uh, for queries uh, you can of course uh, you know the the really simple queries uh, is what is the probability that you know a random variable z takes a class c that's just pi c you just look up in your parameter of your model uh, what is the probability of any x uh, given a z setting um, that you just look up in your uh, in your normal um, so these are directly available um, from your model you just uh, sort of query uh, your model parameters and they answer these probabilistic queries. Um, we will also have queries of the kind I will want to know, well, what is the probability of uh, any particular, you know, of observing a score in that uh, in that distribution? Um, in the histogram, I told you, uh, how likely am I to see, uh, you know, plus 200 or minus 200 are those outliers or are they really likely? 
um, and the marginals uh, or the you know the probability of any particular variable x uh, requires us to you know because our model only does p of x given z it requires us to marginalize out z um, and so we get uh, marginalize the summation over all settings of z uh, p of x given z times p of z this is what we look up from our model this is what we look up from our model um, and this task right here is uh, known as marginalization um, and the other sort of query we'll be interested in is P of uh, Z given X. So I come to you with a data point X and I ask you for this data point, do we believe that this latent variable in your model, uh, was it, uh, you know, uh, Gaussian one or Gaussian two? Um, and this is uh, something that, you know, in, in, if you think about the image generation example where X is an image, Z is a latent variable that might correspond to the presence of certain categories of objects or, you know, the pose of certain objects. You're asking, you know, here is my image. I don't need you to generate the image, but for this image, is there a car in this image or not? Is there a, what pose is it? And so on. Uh, and that's, by the way, these names that I'm giving, car, pose, so on, these are just qualitative examples. Um, in practice, you're, you're, your variable z is unobserved, right? It is unobserved, meaning that we do not know what it means. It's just some latent representation. Um, and this, by the way, elementary sort of, uh, you know, probability 101 math will tell you that this is the uh, joint over the uh, over the marginal. Um, and this will mean that you can, uh, in terms of the, the variables in your parameters, you'll have to write it as p of x. Apologies for the typo. You'll have to write it as x given z, p of z, and in the denominator, the sum of exactly these terms uh, over z, and this is known as uh, an inference problem. I need you to infer the latent variable um, that I'm, I'm talking about. And this right here, the presence of uh, this summation or which will become integration um, in the in the context of continuous variables in the denominator um, is exactly what will make this problem really hard. Um, and in fact, um, you know, if Z is a single uh, discrete variable, then no problem. We'll just write a for loop, we'll estimate the denominator. If Z is uh, contains 200 discrete variables, now you just have to write 200 for loops, which means this is a, a combinatorial explosion. We will never be able to finish that program. Um, if you have to write, uh, if it's Z is a continuous variable, now you have to solve integrals in closed form, which may not have a closed form expression in the first place, or we will have to approximate those integrals through numerical methods, which will be slow as well. So this query in general will be quite expensive and, and slow. All right, so uh, this right here is a, this right here specifically is a Gaussian mixture model, uh, consists of two variables, Z and X. X given Z is a, is a Gaussian, Z is a mixture parameter. That's why the model is called a Gaussian mixture model. Um, all right, uh, and of course, uh, these, these things can be generalized to multivariate Gaussians. Um, so X can live in some RD, um, mu, the mean parameter can live in RD as well. And now we will have, you know, so these are, this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, X dimension one, this is X dimension two. Uh, we can see that, uh, and what we're plotting here are level sets of, uh, of a normal uh, with this mean parameter. This is mu one uh, comma a matrix uh, sigma one, which is a two by two matrix, because this is a two dimensional space. Um, and what we are, uh, uh, each point on this line has the same uh, uh, log probability or probability value um, and sorry sigma is in r d cross d um, and what we uh, know is that there are uh, multi-dimensional generalizations to uh, uh, to normal distributions um, which I can write down, but uh, you know, in this class, in at least, we are not going to be uh, diving too deep um, into analysis or uh, integration uh, with uh, multivariate normals. 
um, we will likely we will we don't have any more homework uh, either. But you will uh, definitely come across these uh, when you uh, see the VAE paper um, or uh, anything in uh, in this sort of literature. Mu um, sigma inverse goes x minus mu. Um, and this is one over two. So this is the density function. It's a it's a generalization, as I said. Uh, there is still an exponent and a quadratic term, uh, except the quadratic is now expressed in the terms of a matrix inverse, uh, and the normalization term uh, is is similarly expressed as well. Okay. Um, demo time. Demos are always good to look at. Um, this is uh, a demo of a of a Gaussian mixture model fitting um, function. Okay. Yes, I want to keep the annotation. All right, so here is a particular demo. This will resemble a lot the k means demo. Uh, there are some data points, they live in some two dimensional space. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, fit uh, four Gaussians um, to this. Um, notice that these are two-dimensional Gaussians, so they are represented as circles. They have mean parameters and covariance matrices. Mean parameters uh, tell us the center of the Gaussian. So, you know, right here would be center number one. This is center of the green. This is center of the blue. This is center of the red. Um, covariance matrices tell us uh, a, a skew uh, and a spread uh, of the of the Gaussian. Um, and we are going to estimate those parameters uh, and the priors, obviously, which are represented by the size of the circles. Um, and so I've just run one iteration of the algorithm, um, which estimates uh, those parameters. It's an iterative algorithm, just like k-means. Um, and notice already that uh, things are beginning to get better, and they look very different. This is not converged yet. Uh, notice that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, purple um, Gaussian has a center that now is covering or is lying on top of these data points, which have also been colored in purple. Um, and the skew of this Gaussian, which is uh, uh, derived by the eigenvectors of the sigma matrix, the sigma matrix is the covariance matrix. Um, we will not go into formally making that connection. You can sort of refresh back to uh, 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 a, a uh, continuous probability uh, class that may have shown you, but you know, take my word for it that if you look at the or a linear algebra class, if you look at the uh, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, they will give you the skew uh, and the stretch. Um, and so this is, seems to also now be giving you a shape of this cluster uh, of these data points. Um, the green one seems to be covering here. The red one seems to be covering half these points and half these points. Blue ones this. And notice that the red uh, Gaussian is represented as larger than the purple one, which is also telling us about the prior, uh, the, the P of Z. There are four Gaussians. I'll run it through a couple of more iterations. Um, and notice that things seem to be converging now. So I'll run it through 10 iterations. So this is at convergence. And at convergence, we have four, we always had four, but now we have four fully estimated parameters of these Gaussians. Uh, there is Gaussian number one, two, three, four, um, and they're nicely sort of capturing uh, parts of our data distribution. Um, there is a red Gaussian that has a skew um, that goes perhaps, uh, what is this, northeast, southwest. Uh, the green Gaussian is uh, isotropic, meaning that it does not seem to have a skew in uh, north, south, or east, west direction. The, the blue one uh, has, a, has, a, has a long stretch, um, and so on. OK. So uh, this is a Gaussian mixture models. It looks and feels like a generalization of k-means. Um, and you can formally make that connection. Uh, k-means can be considered a special case, an approximate inference algorithm, a, a pro approximate parameter learning algorithms for Gaussian mixture models with isotropic uh, Gaussian uh, settings. But we won't go into details of that. Um, and by the way, just like k-means, um, you can, uh, these things are not, uh, uh, the the algorithm here is not repeatable. It is uh, stochastic, meaning that the initialization matters. Um, so here is, for example, a, a different initialization where we seem to get the same one. All right, let's try something else. Oh, 
still the same thing. Ah, much better. Okay, so this is a different initialization uh, where we actually found one of the uh, shortcomings of uh, latent variable models, which is that they sometimes lead to singularity. Uh, this, uh, what happened here is that the green Gaussian um, collapsed, just like k-means picks the data points that are assigned to clusters, uh, uh, expectation maximization and Gaussian mixture model parameter learning also assigns data points to Gaussians. Um, and so the green Gaussian uh, was assigned only two data points. Um, and when you have a two-dimensional distribution um, with, uh, with two data points assigned to a Gaussian, you end up uh, having to estimate a covariance matrix uh, that has rank one. And so the inverse of that covariance matrix doesn't exist. And so you get a one-dimensional distribution in a two-dimensional space, um, and that leads to a singularity. Um, and we'll talk about that problem in a little bit. Um, so uh, these are different initializations of this thing. Um, we get, uh, you know, in, in most of these cases, the same results, but in some cases, different results. Um, by the way, we are having to pick, just like in k-means, uh, we are having to pick the number of clusters. Um, we have to, uh, if we pick a different set of clusters, we will, uh, or different set of Gaussians, we will uh, get different results. With two, it seems to be pretty robust. Okay. All right, um, so let's get back to our lecture. Um, so that is a your first latent variable model. Um, I will use this model as a toy model to tell you all the problems that await you as we move to VAEs. Um, there are uh, there are there are sort of key problems that sort of uh, that await us. Let me see. Okay. Um, hidden data in general causes problems. Um, you know, fitting probabilistic models P of X comma Z is difficult just at its core, algorithmically, mathematically, it is difficult. This is not about an in practice question. It is difficult because it has these problems. Um, a fully observed log, log likelihood factorizes a uh, log marginal likelihood does not factorize. Um, and by that, what I mean is uh, what does parameter learning in GMMs look like? Uh, so here are the parameters in a, in a Gaussian mixture uh, model, right? Um, what the example that we just saw had uh, parameters pi one through pi k. Those are the prior parameters for uh, the latent variable Z. Uh, there are obviously the mu parameters, mu1 through mu k, the means of the of the Gaussians, um, and uh, sigma1 through sigma k, the covariance matrices. Uh, or if you were doing this in one-dimensional x, it would be just a variance uh, uh, parameter. But regardless, these are our parameters. We have to estimate these. Uh, what do we estimate them from? Well, our data set is still just this, right? Um, we have n data points given to us. Um, of some vectors x i that live in some r d um, space. Okay, that's our data set. Um, how do we do parameter estimation? Well, the same way we've been doing this entire class, right? We write cross entropy, which is the same as uh, um, uh, maximum likelihood estimation, and we write down um, the log probability of the data set uh, given our parameters, um, and we um, find the parameter setting theta that maximizes this log probability. And, you know, the churning through the usual math, we sort of look at log probability of data set is the same as i going from 1 through n of probability of xi uh, given theta. Notice our data set just contains xi. It does not contain any zi annotation, right? So that's all the log probability that we can maximize. Um, sorry, uh, that is a typo. I messed up the order of these two. Uh, and it is sum i1 through n log probability of xi. Um, and uh, I was sort of jumping ahead to the problem. And this right here is, we, is where we run into the, to the problem. Um, notice that because this is the marginal of p of xi, in order to get to p of xi, comma zi, 
we have to marginalize our zi and that summation lives inside the log it does not live outside the log there is one summation over data point that lives outside the log that is not a problem there is one summation that uh, lives inside the log and that is a problem it is a problem uh, not just because it's a summation and not integral if this was an integral it would be a nightmare but even at a, at a summation this is a problem because sum of log factorizes into different terms log of sum does not factorize it means all of your parameters so if my all of my parameters are now coupled together um, i have this one objective that depends on everything the entire data set so there is no sgd there is no stochastic sampling because the way the reason why sgd works is because your objective function can be nicely expressed as summation over a bunch of terms and that summation is coming over data points um, uh, data points uh, i if there is a summation sitting inside here then all of these terms log sum uh, depend on theta if theta is is coupling all of these terms if the same theta appears everywhere um, now we have a, a problem uh, it means all uh, we we cannot decouple the estimation of cluster one from the estimation of cluster two um, all of these parameters are sort of uh, sitting there coupled um, it also adds a second problem in that if you have log of sum um, when you start taking gradients you're going to get that summation in the denominator because log of x when you take the gradient with respect to x you're going to get x in the denominator uh, which means that this uh, large summation or integration will be sitting in the denominator in the gradient estimation step um, and so we're going to have to again solve the closed form integral problem um, uh, uh, if, if we are going to have to start taking gradients of this and realize that in supervised learning you do not have this problem because if someone gave you magically y or if z annotated um, then this summation would not exist you would not have to marginalize over uh, over z so that's problem number one um, that uh, lo uh, log marginal likelihoods do not factorize there is a second problem uh, which is of identifiability um, and in order to uh, explain that problem, let me uh, show you that histogram again. Remember, we talked about this histogram. We said there was a Gaussian one, Gaussian two. Um, there was a Gaussian one with mu one equals negative 10 and Gaussian two with mu two equals uh, uh, positive 10. Um, but, and so I was saying that, you know, uh, you know, there was like mu one equals negative 10, mu two equals positive 10. Uh, but realize that this uh, numbering of one and two is arbitrary, right? I could also have said that actually mu one is positive 10 and mu two is negative 10. That uh, which one I'm calling Gaussian number one and which one I'm calling Gaussian number two doesn't matter because I don't really know. There's no, this is not classification. There is no natural numbering to latent variables. Um, I can call this one and this two and that two and that one. Um, and this shows up in your uh, log uh, p of x plot. Um, so this is a plot of mu1 by mu2, um, where it's plotting p of x, uh, so p theta of x, where theta contains our parameters. Um, but as I vary mu1 and mu2, how does the probability of my data set um, vary um, and we are basically looking at uh, these uh, so this point right here um, is a point which is roughly uh, mu 1 equals plus 10 mu 2 equals minus 10 um, this is the uh, the peak uh, of a of a hill that exists on this landscape um, and there is a symmetry to this problem where a similar peak exists uh, on the landscape at mu 1 equals minus 10 and mu 2 equals plus 10. Um, and that symmetry exists for this reason that I just said, that uh, this is an identifiability problem. 
we do not know which one is labeled one, which one is labeled two, um, which means when you plot log p of x as a function of your parameters, there are going to be multiple local maximas. Um, and this right here tells us that this function cannot possibly be convex or concave, right? Um, because there are mirror images where if there is one peak, there must be another peak. So you can never have a claim that of a global optimality of a unique glo uh, global optimal. Um, and by the way, I've, I've drawn this in two dimensions. Um, if there were three Gaussians, uh, then uh, there is a three factorial or a permutation of those three Gaussians where uh, those peaks exist. Um, so in, in K uh, Gaussians, there's K factorial uh, equally likely uh, arg maxes that exist first of all, right? So uh, global optimality yeah, is, is, is out the window. Um, so that's the objective function that we're maximizing. It has multiple bumps all over the place. Uh, there's k factorial of them. Um, and that's only this one kind of uh, identifiability. I can uh, also, you know, if the means and if the covariances are the same, then I can, then there's another kind of unidentifiability where I can pair mean of one with covariance of another um, and, and so on. Um, so this is, this is, uh, you know, hidden data causing problems number two. This is uh, because we don't really have an um, There is a third kind of problem, uh, which is the singularity problem that you already saw in the demo. Um, and this uh, is a one dimensional illustration of the singularity problem, um, which is that, let's say, you know, I have one dimensional X, this is my, and I'm trying to fit it with two Gaussians. Um, what if I come along and I tell you, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take one of the Gaussians and I'm just going to place it on one of your data points. The first data point, I'm going to dedicate a Gaussian to that data point. So mu1 is equal to x1. And by the way, I am just going to shrink its variance. Um, so this is a one dimensional Gaussian. I'm going to shrink its variance to zero, meaning that the sole job, the reason for existence, the raison d'etre for this Gaussian is to explain this one data point. And the entire data set can be explained by, the rest of the data set can be explained by the second data point. If you do that, you're going to get P of X1 given Z equals one, which is the, you know, the likelihood of that one point X1, given the first Gaussian who you set these parameters such that, uh, as these, negative uh, is one over two pi sigma one square e to the negative x one minus mu one square by two sigma one square um, you've set x, mu one equal to x one so this numerator term goes to zero right it's e to the to the power of zero and this denominator term the sigma one square is approaching zero so you end up with something that is e to the zero and the denominator is approaching zero. So this ratio is approaching infinity. It is unbounded. And because P of X one given Z is unbounded, um, you realize that P of X is just summation over Z of P of X given Z times P of Z, right? So therefore P of X is also unbounded because it's just summing over uh, these terms. Um, yes, this data point is poorly explained by the second Gaussian, but it's not negative infinitively ex explained, right? So uh, it has some, exp uh, you know, some likelihood under the second Gaussian. Um, the first Gaussian is just giving it infinite likelihood. Um, and so P of X for your data set is uh, unbounded and going to infinity as well. That is a problem because now it means you have an objective function that you're trying to maximize that has singularities in the positive x direction, in the positive direction, meaning that you're trying to maximize the function which is unbounded from above. So every so often you'll be doing, let's say you were doing gradient descent, you're not going to be doing gradient descent, but let's say you were doing gradient descent and your uh, objective starts going up. Are you happy or sad? Um, this is a problem because if it shoots up to infinity, you are maximizing, you want to maximize it, but you're maximizing something uh, that, uh, uh, that is unbounded from above. Um, so, so 
the likelihood is collapsing, but in the wrong direction, like it can have positive spikes. Now you put together the problems that we just told you, which is uh, that problem number one, all parameters are coupled. So there's this parameter space. Um, it has infinite spikes, uh, which is problem number three. Oh, and by the way, if there is one infinite spike, then there is means that there's k factorial infinite spikes because there is uh, uh, identifiability problems, right? So this is a horrible landscape to be optimizing over. We're supposed to do an arg max of p of x given theta or parameters. Um, it can shoot up to infinity, and there are multiple infinities all over the place. Um, and so that should tell you that this is why, just even mathematically, you know, unsupervised learning in the density estimation setting formulation of the problem is so hard. Um, it's just a very ill-posed problem, poorly conditioned problem in this case, as you'd say. Okay, so now that I've uh, scared you enough, um, let us march ahead and see what we can what we can do in this space. Um, so variational autoencoders are uh, are latent variable models. They construct uh, a particular uh, kind of uh, joint distribution, p of x given z. They construct p of z given x. They construct p of x given z, um, and they uh, use neural networks to do so. Um, Okay, um, so uh, variational autoencoders are a combination, uh, are latent variable models that uh, that use neural networks to perform um, inference estimation of of uh, certain kinds of uh, of neural networks of certain kinds of uh, random variables. Um, they are a combination of the following four ideas, um, and what we'll do is we'll sort of teach you these ideas separately, disentangled from each other, and then we'll put together uh, VAEs as the final product. Um, and the reason why we're teaching you these ideas separately is because we we think that they are independently useful. You will find these ideas valuable even outside the context of uh, VAEs. It will make this sort of exposition someone protracted it will seem like you know why aren't you getting to VAEs why don't you just tell me what VAEs are why are you telling me all these intermediate stuff um, and the answer is there will be an aha moment when we put it all together but the intermediate stuff is useful on its own you will find value in these intermediate stuff because you will use them uh, even outside of VAEs so let's look at the first one uh, variational autoencoders so what are autoencoders uh, that part's fairly straightforward uh, autoencoders uh, are a kind of neural networks uh, that go from X to X. Um, uh, they are a, 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 an unsupervised learning approach uh, for learning low dimensional feature representations from uh, unlabeled training data. Um, autoencoders have nothing to do with density estimation. Um, they have nothing to do with latent variable density estimation. They, this, they are an idea that have existed on their own um, for, you know, years if not decades before VAE um, and it's it's the simple idea that I can you know take uh, X's input um, I can have a you know let's say oops sorry uh, X lives in some uh, RD dimensional space uh, I can have a neural network that brings it down to some Z or K dimensional space where K is less than uh, D um, and then what I can do is I can um, oh, and you can use obviously all the standard uh, tools that we've taught you: linear layers, uh, sigmoid, or, uh, or the nonlinearities, uh, relus. Um, you know, you can have fully connected layers or convolutions or whatever. Um, but I can uh, I can then uh, try to predict from Z back an estimate of X. Um, so the goal is reconstruction of the input data, which is why it's called auto encoding uh, to encode yourself, if you will. Um, and this makes it also very clear why Z living in some R K K has to be less than D, uh, because if K is identical to D or larger than than D, then uh, this is just an identif identity function. Then there's nothing to learn. Uh, if, for example, K is equal to D, then your uh, fully connected uh, matrix just has to be a diagonal matrix that's just copying over values. Um, um, and so, what? Uh, so you know, we can do this for images as well using four-layer uh, 
so this part is called an encoder. This part is called a decoder. Um, we can do this with images by having uh, encoders contain convolutional layers, decoders contain uh, transpose convolutional layers, um, and it can be simple. Um, that I you make a prediction of x hat and I compare that to the real x and I just do L2 loss. Um, and this right here uh, does not require any uh, uh, any training data other than x. It does. There's no y. Um, this is a uh, you know input only method. Um, and then the point of this method is to compress your data to go from um, you know R D to R K so that you can reconstruct back in RD. Um, and the hope is that these this low dimensional representation learned by this neural network um, will uh, will tell you something about meaningful factors of variation. Um, a, you know, that hope is not always satisfied, but that's the sort of hope at least. Um, and you can imagine things like, you know, if I know I'm uh, reconstructing, I need to reconstruct images, maybe I learn, I need to learn something about, uh, what sort of categories are present, what spatial arrangements make sense, uh, something about uh, how scenes are laid out. Um, if there are outdoor scenes, maybe the grass is at the bottom and the sky is at the top and so on, um, because that's the, those are the statistics of my data set uh, and that, that have to be learned all by, by Z. Um, the way these things are, yeah, so this doesn't use labels. Um, I had a demo to show here. I will skip it in the interest of time, but I can I can show it once we are in the QA phase of this. Um, the way these things are uh, used is typically after training. Uh, you, typically, these are used as pre-training methods, meaning that you unsupervise pre-training. So after training, you throw away the decoder um, and you use this low dimensional Z representation as features on which to do classification. Um, and you can either uh, fine tune the encoder jointly with the classifier or you can freeze the encoder. Uh, and this is uh, 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 sort of, uh, you know, there can be a lot more parameters here. So there can be this neural network that does the encoder can have lots of parameters and maybe you've used a large data set which is unlabeled to do this pre-training and maybe you're using a smaller data set to do this classification. Uh, and so this part of the network is frozen. Um, okay. Uh, and so the encoder can be used to initialize a supervised learning model. All right, so um, uh, one of the sort of key problems um, with autoencoders, which is why we are getting to uh, variational autoencoders, is if you stare at this, um, realize that even though I'm using the same notation, x, z, x hat, z here is not a random variable. This is not a random variable. It is a deterministic function. Z is a deterministic function parameterized by theta, which are the parameters of this of this neural network. So this encoder, uh, which is parameterized by some theta, um, or let me say f theta. Uh, so Z is f theta of x. It is a deterministic function. It is not a random variable. Um, and x hat, by the way, is some deterministic function of Z. Um, so there's a decoder here, it has some parameters phi, that's what I'm calling G phi. Um, that's what we are we are at. Um, you cannot ask a question like, what is the probability of Z given X? Um, there is no probabilistic interpretation of Z. There is no uncertainty in Z because these are deterministic computations. You cannot ask the question, what is the probability of X hat given Z? It's not a uh, stochastic operation. These are all deterministic operations. Um, we would like that. We would like stochasticity here. It is a reasonable question to ask, why would you want stochasticity in the first place? Well, so we can sample from this. Um, maybe there are many possible ways of reconstructing X given a particular latent representation. Maybe we have lost certain information. Um, and what we would like to see is a sense of what do the different reconstructions look like. If we have a deterministic operation, we only get one answer. That's it. If we have a stochastic operation, we can talk about sampling from this conditional distribution. And so this is what motivates VAEs. VAEs are probabilistic autoencoders uh, that contain 
a probabilistic encoder. Um, so an encoder uh, that returns not just a stochastic, uh, not just a deterministic function, but an encoder that gives you back the probability of uh, it converts z into a written uh, into a random variable and it gives you back an object that says here's the probability of z given x for the x that you have brought me um, and here is the probability of x hat or x tilde for the z that you have brought me um, so it is a probabilistic encoder and a probabilistic decoder uh, that give you back conditional probabilities and that's uh, so VAEs are a probabilistic spin on autoencoders and they will let us sample from the model uh, to generate data. Autoencoders do not let you sample. So that was the connection between VAEs and autoencoders. And uh, this is why this right here is why they are latent variable models because Z is unannotated. Uh, so we are con using a neural network to construct this conditional distribution and we will also use a neural network to construct this distribution p of x hat given z uh, x hat is now just another variable it's our it's a it's different from x it's our reconstruction okay so now we understand autoencoders uh, we also understand the need for variational autoencoders they're probabilistic autoencoders uh, let's take a look at this idea of variational approximation we have three minutes. I will introduce the high level idea today um, and we will continue with the variational lower bound and elbow calculation um, uh, next time. So the, the key problem in variational uh, inference, it is a mathematical technique that is independent of VAEs. It has existed for a long time. I think uh, variational inference is early 1900s, uh, if not older than that. Um, but it's a it's a technique that uh, has existed in statistics for a, for a long time. Um, it is this this really elegant idea that uh, here's the problem. I have uh, I want to compute p of z given x in a latent variable model. Although in its original formulation, it was not particularly concerned with latent variable models. I have two random variables x and z, and I want to compute this quantity p of z given x um, and uh, by running chain rule, I know that this is p of uh, z comma x divided by x, and I know that this is equal to uh, p of uh, x given z, p of z, and oh, by the way, the you know the marginal in the denominator has a summation over z, p of x given z, p of z. And you know sometimes this can be an integral if z is continuous, and we are computer scientists and we don't like solving integrals. And that's sort of the my whiny definition of the problem. The more formal definition of the problem is that the denominator is intractable or to compute. So that's the problem. Um, this object is hard to compute because there's something in the denominator uh, that is hard to compute. Um, variational inference says, look, this is a distribution p of z right let's forget about x like the, yeah so there's something which is complex this is a complex distribution over a random variable uh, z why don't we uh, simplify it uh, by using a simple distribution q of z um, and so a variational uh, inference asks this question uh, it's a class of methods for approximate inference um, and it says you know reality is complex instead of performing uh, approximate computation in something complex can we just perform exact computation in something simple um, and we just need to make sure that the simple thing is close to the complex thing um, and more formally um, just sort of to go back it says look instead what we're going to do is we're going to define a family of simple things so maybe q is uh, parameterized by some family uh, so this is the set of simple things, uh, the set of simple distributions. Simple distribution. Where you will define an appropriately simple distribution and hint, hint, it's always going to be Gaussians. <laughs> like anytime someone says simple distributions, they're going to come up with Gaussian. But in any way, um, there is a family of simple distributions. There is some complex distribution, P of Z. And what we can do is we can just search for the closest simple distribution, right? We can just search for Q star or Q of phi star of Z, 
which is closest in some distances. So I, what I can just say is I can minimize some distance between P and Q where I search over this simple family. Uh, oh, search over the simple family Q that lies in this set Q by MC. Okay. So this is an optimization problem, a well-defined optimization problem. And my question to you before I let you folks go is, do we know of any distance measures between two probability distributions? Ever heard of something in homework zero? Maybe there was some not distance, but divergence measure. TL divergence, excellent, yes. So what we can do is we can use KL divergence between P and Q here. And uh, because of what you proved in homework zero, which by the way, maybe is getting rusty right now, you proved that KL is not symmetric. Um, and so you almost immediately have to uh, sort of address the question, are we going to do um, KL, uh, P to Q, or are we going to do KL Q to P? And turns out that, uh, you know, this is where we'll end the story today. It's going to be a cliffhanger, hang out for, you know, check out for the next time. Turns out that this is going to be the right direction of doing the approximation, but the right way is going to be hard. This is going to be the wrong way of doing uh, approximate variational inference, but Perhaps as a metaphor to life, uh, this is going to be easy. Um, and so we will, you know, preach our morals and tell you that, you know, this is the right way of doing things. Um, but then we'll sort of give up and say, all right, fine. Here's what we'll actually implement. It's the wrong direction. Here's why it's wrong. We, we understand it's wrong, uh, but at least it'll lead to algorithms uh, that are easy to implement. Um, so let me pause there because we're uh, top there because we are. Uh, a couple of minutes over um, and I can answer questions um, and this is where we'll pick up from next time uh, and I promise this will make sense in the context of VAEs because uh, variational inference this slide right here uh, the slide on variational inference is exactly why variational autoencoders are called variational this is variational part of course too um, this is variational approximation um, all right let me take a look at questions